Aloha, everyone. It's so great to see you here today. I want to welcome you to our final lecture of the 35th Annual Experts at the Cathedral Lecture Series. My name is Andrea Nandosquare, and I'm the Education Program Manager at Historic Hawaii Foundation. I want to give a big mahalo to our event partner, Dr. Ralph Cam, who is the curator and coordinator of the expert series. Dr. Cam is a lecturer with the Historic Preservation Graduate Certificate Program, American Studies Department at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. HHF is so pleased to co-sponsor this series. And this series is in collaboration with the 175th anniversary of the construction of Washington Place. So this year's lectures explore six residences that are significant to the life of Queen Lilio Okalani. Today is our final lecture, as I mentioned, and we're so happy to those of you who have joined us um, for previous lectures. I want to just um, reiterate that all of the lectures are being recorded. This one is being live streamed right now on the HHF YouTube and Facebook pages and you may view those afterwards. Please share with family and friends and community if you enjoyed today's lecture and, many, and the previous ones. If you have questions during the lecture and also at the end during the Q&A portion, please type them into the chat um, on the Zoom menu bar and our speaker will respond to as many as we can. We also will have a brief survey again today after the lecture, and it's really helpful if you can just take a couple of minutes and share your mana'o with us and let us know what you thought of the lecture. For those new to Historic Hawaii Foundation, we are a statewide nonprofit that helps people save historic places, sites that tell the stories of the multi-layered history of Hawaii. We do this through education, advocacy, assistance, and protection of and for historic places. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Ralph Kam, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Dr. Kam. Thank you, Andrea. I'm, I'm so pleased to uh, introduce, introduce Zita Kup Choi. Uh, if you could take any one person and get them to speak on this topic, uh, she is the person. She has been affiliated with the Iolani Palace for more than 40 years. Uh, she took her 1977 docent class, served as a volunteer, and has since shared the story of the palace and its ali'i with th literally thousands of visitors. Uh, Zita joined the staff in 2003, and initially she trained docents and worked as the palace registrar. She now serves as the palace historian. Uh, Zita, as you'll be able to tell from her presentation, has always had a love for history and a zest for research. Her extensive research helps to support a wide variety of palace programs and initiatives. And during her free time, and I find this uh, interesting, Zita volunteers at Washington Place, which was the first lecture we had in this series. And she loves to read nonfiction history, that doesn't surprise me, and biographies. So without any further ado, uh, Zita Kupchoi. Aloha Avakea. Mahalo to the Historic Hawaii Foundation for inviting me to speak today. Also mahalo to Dr. Ralph Kam and the Historic Preservation Program up at the University of Hawaii. And a special thank you to all, my pre all the previous presenters for this series. My presentation is on Lili Okalani and Iolani Palace. You're gonna see a lot of text on some of the slides, but that's more for me rather than for you. If I was doing the presentation at the cathedral, that would be in the notes section. So Lili Okalani and Iolani Palace. Ah, my forward button isn't working. Lita, you can also try the space bar. 
Oh, there it is. Okay. I should do that rather than the enter button. <laughs> Thank you. This is an aerial view of Iolani Palace taken in 1927. Two blocks, Malka from the palace is Lydia Kalani's birth site. Two blocks in the Eva direction is the site of her, the home of her Hanai parents. Actually, I should not be calling her Lydia Okalani yet. She's Lydia right now. Two blocks in the Eva direction is the site of the home of her Hanai parents, Konia and Paki, and her Hanai sister, Bernice Pawai. Roughly two miles from the palace is her Palama residence. One to two miles in the other direction are her Waikiki residences and one block, two blocks rather, Malka, Washington Place and 11 miles in that direction is her home or hangout in Malawili. There is one other residence that we did not include in this series and that's Royal School because aren't boarding schools residents? Lydia was enrolled when she was three and a half years old. Classmates who later have connections to Iolani Palace include her brother, David Kalaakawa, William Charles Lunalilo, and siblings, Alexander Liho Liho Iolani, Kamehameha IV, Lot Kamehameha, Kamehameha V, and their sister, Victoria Kamamalu. Victoria Kamamalu? because in 1844, her father, Governor Keikuana Oa, began construction on a home. This was to be a home for Victoria. In November of 1844, there was a wonderful story in the Polynesian newspaper talking about the governor's new palace. I think it's wonderful because there's information about the interiors. There's no photos that I have ever seen of the interiors of this home. So to have this description allows us to better imagine what was happening when parties were held there. Victoria never had a chance to use the palace, however, because in eight, January of 1845, Kamehameha V moved the capital from Lahaina to Honolulu and began renting the home from the governor. His Majesty, over the next year or so, built two pretty little houses, one on each side of the palace. This is kind of a tradition Pre-contact Hawaii, Royals Ali'i had compounds. One structure was for official occasions as this home was being used for, and then other structures for daily life. So I'm gonna fast forward to about 20 years to 1863. Kamehameha V con consulted with the Privy Council because he wanted to name the home Alexander Palace after his brother, Alexander Liho Liho Iolani. The Privy Council, through their secretary, David Kalaakawa, replied they would prefer the name Iolani Palace. Later that afternoon, the King's secretary, John Owen Dominus, replied the home is now known as Iolani Palace. About 18 months earlier, John Owen Dominus had married Lydia Pa Key. You hear a lot of stories, contemporary stories, that her mother-in-law did not attend the wedding because she was unhappy. English language newspapers and this Hawaiian language newspaper say she was there. That arrow is pointing to the phrase ame ka makuahine o ke kane. So the mother of the room. Lydia begins attending events as the wife of a government official. John Owen Dominus, secretary to the, to the King, a member of the House of Nobles, Adjutant General, and later Governor of Oahu. I was looking for, this is an invitation in the Bishop Museum collection that was in a case in Washington Place for years. This says M. Dominus, and since it's in the Lidi Okalani collection up at Bishop Museum, I would rather imagine this is Lydia, not Mary. It says M. Dominus. His Majesty the King will be happy to have your company at Iolani Palace to a ball on Wednesday, the 26th inst at 9 o'clock p.m. D. Kalakawa Chamberlain. This invitation was issued on April 17th, 1865. I found no mention at all of this party in the English language newspapers. 
However, in a Hawaiian language newspaper, there is a story. It begins with a reception and meal for the officers of a British Navy ship that is in port. And then at nine o'clock, there's a ball. It lasts until three o'clock in the morning. I've done some looking for Lydia attending events prior to being given the name Lidi Okalani. And I found it's kind of really interesting because the newspapers don't have a style guide that say this is what she's supposed to be called. Between 1874 and 1877, I saw her mentioned as Princess Lydia Kamaka Eha, Princess Lydia K. Dominus, Lydia, Princess Lydia and Governor Dominus, Princess Lydia Dominus, Princess Lydia Kamaka Eha Dominus, the Honorable Mrs. Governor Dominus, Mrs. Dominus Jr., to differentiate her from her mother in law, Mary, and Mrs. Kamaka Eha Dominus. This last is kind of strange because until the 1980s, you didn't use a given name with your title and your husband's last name unless you were widowed or divorced. So I, I kind of think whoever was writing the story about the tea she hosted that day was not really paying attention closely. In 1874, her brother, David Kalakaua, becomes king. He names his brother Leleo Hoku his heir. This announcement goes out from Iolani Palace. Iolani Palace is now 29 years old. So he's in need of repair. Just before he leaves for his trip to the United States, he asks his brother-in-law, Archibald Scott Cleghorn, to fix the home up. When he returns in February, he finds Cleghorn has torn the house, had the house torn down and has had three buildings on the grounds repaired and painted. These buildings are Kinaohale, the reception and dining hall, and Prince Leleo Hoku's residence. Remember, Leleo Hoku right now is heir to the throne. This is a diagram of the grounds. The blue arrows point to Richards Street Gate Kina and the red arrow, Kinauhale. Kinauhale is one of these homes. Kinauhale or Iolani Palace is where events began to happen. After Lelea Hoku's death, the announcement that Lydia is now heir to the throne is done at Iolani Palace. So this is the announcement both in English and in Hawaiian. On December 31st, 1879, on Queen Kapi'olani's birthday, the cornerstone of our palace is laid by the Lodge de Progress to Oceania, Kalakala's Lodge. Not participating in the ceremony, but present, watching, was Princess Lee Okalani, Princess Like Like, and Princess Ruth Kimi Okalani. The newspaper stated, the palace is probably going to be finished in the coming summer. Not, it wasn't done until two more years. And will be in all respects by far the finest and most imposing building on the islands. A fitting abode for royalty. Kalakaua had the palace built to send a message that Hawaii is an independent, sovereign nation that is modern, educated, and technologically advanced. In 1881, when Kalakaua was traveling around the world, Lidi Okalani served as regent. Audiences and receptions. Audiences are meetings that are formal. Receptions are meetings that are informal. Sometimes she used Kina'u Hale, sometimes she used Ali'i Olani Hale, sometimes she used Washington Place, and sometimes she used the palace. These were diplomats, Navy officers, a retiring Catholic bishop and his replacement. When his replacement called on her at Iolani Palace, she gave him a royal order to deliver to Father Damien on Molokai. For her birthday, September 2nd, a Hawaiian serenade appeared on the grounds. Music, the newspaper commented, this is a temperance program, so no alcohol was served. In the summer of 1882, the legislature appropriated money for an additional building on the grounds to allow the king to break away from the rigid formality of the new palace. This is Halekoa, or the Pink Bungalow, located where Iolani Barracks now sits. So this is where they spent a lot of off-duty and private time. In August 1st, 1882, Queen Kapi'olani hosted a luau on the palace lanai. 
for members of the Legislative Assembly. This is the lanai after Kalakala's coronation because these are coronation gifts. This gives you an idea of the space the legislators had for their luau. It wasn't a very extended luau though because they just took a recess. They had to get back to work, short, short lunch. Eight days later, Kalakaua hosted a banquet in the dining hall. This is a photo taken in 1893. His guests would not have used this furniture made by the A.H. Davenport Company, a special order for Iolani Palace. This furniture was still in transit. So I'm really curious to know what they sat on and what they ate at. The A.H. Davenport Company furniture is now state of Hawaii property. They are the ones that pay to restore it. And the furniture is now on loan from the Hawaii State Archives. So you can see it when you come visit. In December, Kalakaua hosted a Masonic St. John's Day Banquet at Iolani Palace. This large image is a object in our collection. It is printed, it's a newspaper story about the banquet printed on silk. So if you attended the banquet and you wanted a souvenir, go down to the advertiser and buy it. That same newspaper stated that after the banquet, ladies had not been invited. As a panacea to the ladies who had not been invited, he had a musical soiree after the banquet. The Saturday press stated the banquet ended at the noon hour of night, which leads me to wonder, did the music hall really start at 2.30 or one o'clock in the morning? Can't tell from the other newspaper reports. Entertaining began in earnest. One of the first huge events was the coronation of Kalakaua and Lee Kapi'olani on February 12th, 1883. The royal family lined up in the hallway of the palace, walked down this runway for the ceremony. This diagram appears in the Hawaiian Gazette. Lili Okalani is at the Blue Arrow. Their Majesties King Kalakaua and Queen Kapi'olani are at the Red Arrow. The Blue Arrow, I think that might be Lili Okalani because I think Kapi'olani and Kalakaua would have been in this area. Coronation events continued with a ball, a dinner, a luau with hula, and the unveiling of the Kamehameha statue. One of the newspapers said, the absence of Princess Lidi Okamani and Princess Like Like from the state dinner was food for much comment, both on the evening and of the occasion and since. So Lidi Okamani and Like Like did not attend the dinner. Kapilani's sisters did. Don't know why. They might have declined the invitation. They might not have been invited in the first place, which reminds me that 19th century newspapers might say the king entertained at breakfast yesterday. That's it. The king entertained the legislators at breakfast yesterday, or the king entertained the legislators and their wives at breakfast yesterday. Sometimes names are mentioned, sometimes names aren't mentioned. So to try to determine who is attending parties is hard. Kind of easy to determine who's hosting them though. Kalakaua entertained at meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, sometimes on the palace grounds, sometimes in the basement dining room. A lot of times these are guests from abroad or guests from the other islands, government officials. And one time in 1887, family. Breakfast that morning was for their majesties, the king and queen, her Royal Highness Princess Lili Okavani, Her Royal Highness Princess Kaiulani, and her father, Archibald S. Clayhorn, and His Majesty's Chamberlain, Colonel C. P. Ialkea. Luaus. Luaus occurred on the palace grounds, usually under a tent, or they call this a lanai, outside. In 1887, right after the Queen and Princess Lili Okavani had returned from attending Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee, the education societies gave a luau at the palace. The education societies were societies created by Lidi Okalani to raise money to provide scholarships and grants. So you can continue your education after you have graduated from either public or private schools locally. In addition to hosting luaus on the palace grounds, luaus were also hosted at Halikoa. These were usually for the Royal Guard or volunteer militia units in the pink bungalow, usually family parties. 
the ones I think that are really amusing are the luau's for Prince Kili Ahonui, Prince Kawana Nakoa, or Prince Kohio Kalaniana Ole. These parties are held on their birthdays, and usually they are when the boys are in California in school. So the guests of honor, not here. Luau is also hosted in the boathouse. That's where the federal building is today, visiting Navy officers and family parties again. A Luau was hosted in the basement hallway in 1890. The Hawaiian Gazette said this is the 47th anniversary of Hawaiian Independence Day. This isn't Hawaiian Independence Day, that's in November. This is Restoration Day. Audiences, receptions, balls, and dances in the throne room. Balls are more formal than dances. Balls would mean the men are in uniform. Diplomatic corps, government officials, all required attendance. Dances are informal occasions. Family members, friends of the host or hostess. Dances also meant the men were in suits rather than uniforms. If you're looking at reports of audiences and receptions, the royal family are standing in front of the thrones rather than sitting on them. One no report said Her Royal Highness Princess Lady Okalani occupied a position on one side of the dais during the reception. And think about traditional cultural norms. Your head is not supposed to be above the head of a ali'i. So they were being very kind to their guests by being in front of the dais or standing on it rather than sitting down. Receptions and music halls will happen in the blue room as well. But not all happy events were hosted in Iolani Palace. The body of Princess Like Like, their sister, Kalakala and Lili Okalani's sister, Princess Kailani's mother, lay in state in the throne room prior to her funeral. Members of the royal family during the funeral service were at the head of the coffin. Lili Okalani is regent again when her brother travels to the United States, California in particular in 1890. He's expected home at the end of January. Mid-January, this invitation goes out. The acting chamberlain of the household is commanded by Her Royal Highness Princess Lydia Kalani Regent to invite Mr. T. Lishman, that's Thomas, to a ball to be given at Iolani Palace at 8.30 o'clock on the evening of the arrival of His Majesty the King from California. Kalaka arrived home on January 29th. He had died in California. So he is being conveyed from the pier to Iolani Palace in a casket. Lidio Kalani is summoned to the Blue Room where she is asked to take the oath of office. In our autobiography, she said, she didn't want to take the oath right away. She wanted an opportunity to mourn her brother first. She also says, implies, she didn't particularly want to sign the oath to that constitution because this required her to support the 1887 constitution, which hundreds, thousands of individuals had petitioned her brother to get rid of. She was to receive many of those petitions herself. Her attempts to get rid of that constitution so, got it back. I was getting ahead of myself there. So I want to talk about Kalakala's funeral first. He lay in state in the throne room. It looks as if the public was only allowed to visit one day. The rest of the time between the 29th and his funeral service on February 15th, people, members of the court, members of the family, other retainers were in attendance 24-7. During his funeral service, a by invitation only funeral service, a chant based on Psalm 90, which had been composed by Her Majesty Queen Lady Okalani, was sung by the combined choirs. So Lady Okalani's attempt to get rid of that 1887 constitution caused her to be deposed and the monarchy overthrown. Within eight, oh, so sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself again. She, the court's in mourning. She doesn't really start celebrating parties until September. This is an invitation to a luau for her birthday, an invitation to a ball for her birthday. She also planned a state meal. None of these events took place. They all had to be canceled because her husband had died. So the court went into mourning. 
Audience and receptions continued. Breakfast renewed and began again in November. Audience and receptions, roughly a dozen during her reign. Don't really want to talk about the dignitaries that visited. I do want to mention that the, a committee of ladies from Kuaiha'o Church called on the queen to tell her the royal pew was ready for her occupancy. She used the royal pew at Kuaiha'o Church the following Sunday. In November of 1892, 30 cyclists arrived on the palace grounds. Each bike was illuminated with Chinese lanterns. After a review of the cyclists and their bikes, this was outside. Queen Lady Okalani presented the Pacific Wheelmen, this is a bicycling club, with a $50 check for fencing around their new track in Pearl City. Giving and receiving of royal orders also occurred in the throne room. In 1891 and 1892, Her Majesty Queen Lady Okalani confirmed the royal order of Kamehameha on government officials, businessmen, the French Council, Prince Kawananakoa, and Prince Kohil. The order of Kapiolani was given to Henry Berger for his work with the Royal Hawaiian Band. The order of Kapiolani, one of the criteria for it is service in terms of the arts or healthcare. The order of the Crown of Hawaii to businessmen and members of the Royal Hawaiian Band. Lady Okalani was a recipient of the Order of the Rising Sun in 1882. It was presented to her at Washington Place. In 1892, the Grand Cross of the Imperial Japanese Order of the Crown was presented to her by a representative of the Emperor of Japan. There are several different versions of this royal order. And since I don't know which one she was given, I'm not sharing a photograph of it with you. But I will share a photograph. This is the order this is a miniature order of the sacred treasure. This is on a bracelet that is on display in our basement galleries. 27 members of her staff and government were given the order of the sacred treasure. So there are four classes of that order. And you can see how many in each class was given to people that were um, working with her. You would think for someone that was involved so much as she was in music, there would be more than two concerts on the grounds, only two by the Royal Hawaiian Band. She did, however, host a musicale in the throne room in May, May 12th, as a matter of fact. This is Adam Jensen, our state archivist, holding the certificate that was given to her along with a piano. This is a photograph of the certificate. This is the piano in Washington Place, and this is a copy of the certificate on the wall in Washington Place. Blue Owls. Lady Okalani was circling the kingdom in 1891. She and her brother and her, both her brothers, Leleohoku when he was regent in 74, and Kalakau when he became king, traveled around the kingdom to touch bases with everybody. What do you need? How can we help? What do you want? When she returned to Honolulu in June of 1890 from an outer island trip, the Nohoa Society hosted a luau. This is the only time Hawaiian food was served in the state dining room. The Nihoa Society was a society set up to visit Nihoa Island. Lady Okalani traveled with them in 1895. They were there to check up on the birds and plant trees. In January of 1892, her accession luau was held on the palace grounds. She arrived at 3.30 and the newspaper said by five, the guests had scattered. There was a large lanai for about 500 and a smaller lanai for 100 to 200. I think, think of that as a cakey table. Roughly three to 4,000 people attended the party. So they were served in cycles, which means if you look at the time and how many people were there, we only had 30 to 40 minutes to eat and hardly any time to talk story at all. But a luau hosted by the queen on the palace grounds, I think we would have been there. The newspaper said the poi did not fail nor the pig cease until all were filled. It's not all parties. The Daily Bulletin in January of 1892 said Her Majesty the Queen enjoys a game of croquet at the palace grounds every afternoon. Meals, a lot fewer than Kalakaua did. Breakfast 11 times, 
and with apologies to descendants of people that attended those meals, I didn't find any of the guests' food or entertainment compelling enough to want to share today. Lunch in June of 1892. This is the kind of reporting the newspapers did. This was a meal for a captain and officers of an Austria-Hungarian ship. You can see the band program and you can see what was served. Dinner. First date dinner was in February of 1892. 34 guests sat down at 8 p.m. There were no speeches where toasts were made. At 10.45, everyone withdrew to the blue room. They didn't see what say what they did there. During that period of time and during much of the early 20th century, ladies would withdraw so the men could have their cigars and a little bit more alcohol before they got together again for more conversation. I don't imagine Lady Okalani would have wanted to withdraw because she smoked herself. This particular dinner included wines and other alcohol. Dinner at Iolani Palace to Rear Admiral George Brown. No alcohol, coffee or tea. And that's, that was it. Her February, not February, her September 1892 birthday began with Ho'okuku from 6 to 8 a.m. When I read about Ho'okuku from 6 to 8 a.m., both hers and both Kalakawa's, I'm, why so early in the morning? I mean, you're a monarch, you can do it later in the day. We were serenaded by the van. Ho'okuku were brought in the form of four-footed and feathered creatures, fit and fat for food. They weren't ready to be cooked. They had to be, they were need to be taken care of first. Tributes from the vegetable kingdom and beautiful and rare artistic handicrafts. At 11, there was an official reception for government officials, officers of the naval ship and the diplomatic and council corps. A luau began at 1.30 in the afternoon, receiving for four to 500, music by the Royal Hawaiian Band. And her chamberlain had arranged for guests to be seated, arranged by the language they spoke. So you could have a lot of good talk story at that luau. A smaller scale luau, this is the only second luau during her reign, was held actually was held in November for the Leimamo Choral Society and Hale Nawa in honor of his late majesty, King Halakawa's birthday. There's no details about that luau other than the fact that it occurred. In February of 1892, Lidio Kalani read in the newspaper about a 12th birthday costume ball. Mr. and Mrs. Schaefer gave their daughter. She desired to see the costumes for herself so she sent out invitations to all the children who had been involved in the Schaefer Ball. A comment in the newspaper said how wonderful it is for the children to have an invitation in their very own name. So on the evening of February 22nd at 7.30, this is a lot earlier than adults would have been expected to arrive, in the Blue Room, in order of height, the children lined up, led by the four and a half year olds dressed as butterflies, marched across the hall to meet the queen. In our collection is a French page costume worn by Master William Hyman. His dad was a businessman in Honolulu. The next ball occurred on March 17th, 1892 in honor of the birthday of Kamehameha III. Hundreds were invited. The day before the ball, the newspaper warned everybody you're going to be entering through the Richard Street gate and entering through the Eva basement door after an informal reception. And it would have to have been an informal reception because if everyone was introduced to the queen, we probably would not have started dancing until after midnight. Dancing began played by the Royal Hawaiian Orchestra. So the band had a, the band as we know it today, but there was also a string section of the Royal Hawaiian Band. They usually played music at balls. The band of the US fleet ship San Francisco was seated on a platform off the back lanai to play music between dance numbers. A ball in July for the Legislative Assembly, the newspaper said before it happened, invitations are being ex issued on a somewhat exclusive scale. But if you read the story about the ball, the legislatures were invited, the judiciary, civil servants, the diplomatic and counselor corps, officers on British and naval ships in port, 
representatives of prominent commercial enterprises and gentlemen of processions like doctors, dentists, and lawyers. I think this was another ball where there were hundreds of people in attendance. This is a dance card. On the left, you see the orders of dances. On the right, you can see the names of the men that signed up to dance with the woman whose dance card this belonged to. And I didn't think, to, and I don't believe it is a kupuna of the person that donated the card to, well, might have been. I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't check on that. The fourth and last ball Video Kalani hosted was on August 9th for officers of a French Navy flagship. Again, the Richard Street and basement entrance were used. One of the newspaper stories said the long mirrors reflected the rich and elegant attire of the ladies and beautiful uniforms of the men. This is a contemporary photo of the, the throne room. This is a Lehulu gown, which is now a copy of a gown that Kapiulani wore in London. It is now on display in the Queen's bedroom. This is a lilac gown, a copy of a gown Lady Okalani had made, also on display upstairs now. This is a lilac gown again when it was on display in the throne room. Lady Okalani wore this gown according to Bishop Museum Records, who has the gown in their collection now, when she prorogued or closed down the 1892 legislative session. This was in early January of 1893. After she closed the session, she invited her cabinet members to meet with her in the Blue Room, asking them to support her introduction of a constitution that would have gotten rid of that 1887 constitution, which thousands had petitioned both her brother and herself to get rid of. They refused to assist this attempt to introduce the new constitution caused the queen to be deposed and the monarchy ended. Within 18 months, supporters were making plans to restore her to power. They were arrested and she was arrested. This is Nidhi Okamani being brought up the back steps of Iolani Palace as a prisoner. January 16th, 1895, one year shy of the second anniversary of when she was deposed. In the hall on the second floor, there was a brief pause as they walked her to her imprisonment chamber. Strangely enough, it was directly beneath this magnificent lifestyles oil painting of the queen. Video Kalani was being held prisoner in one room that had been her home. The red box outlines the mirrors, the windows she could see through. This is a floor plan. She had access to the Makai Lanai, the Diamond Head Lanai, the tower room, the corner room, and the bath. She wrote to her niece, sorry, she had to undergo a trial in what had been her throne room, where she was convicted of being accessory to the plot sentenced to five years hard labor and $5,000. Sentenced to commuted to time spent in the upstairs room. She wrote her niece in July of 1895. Since my imprisonment, I have been allowed every comfort and my friends send me flowers, fruitcake, jelly, soups, and all sorts of delicacies. After office hours, I am allowed to go on the verandas and permission is given to me to go downstairs around the house but not to go with a hundred feet of the fence. But I don't like to go down on account of the soldiers. There are so many. The whole basement is full of soldiers so that I prefer to remain in my room till evening when we take our walks out on the veranda. Video Kalani was eventually paroled to Washington Place, then paroled to Oahu. Both paroles meant she couldn't leave Washington Place, then she couldn't leave Oahu in both instances. Before she received visitors or before she went visiting, she had to get an approval from the government. She was pardoned in October of 1896 and promptly left to travel to the United States in December of 1896. She made several trips to the United States over the next decade. The next time we had the next time we knew about Lady Okalani being at the palace was for Flag Day in 1915. But I tripped across an article about Kamehameha Day in 1914. There was a parade from Aala Park down King Street onto the palace grounds. The participants then gathered around the bandstand to listen to speeches. 
Reserve seats had been prepared for the guests of honor that morning, who included Governor Pink, King, Pinkham, one little personages, so mostly businessmen and government officials, and Queen Lady Okalani, who was surrounded by her household and a few friends. She looked remarkably well and graciously acknowledged the salutations of a host of people who passed. She was dressed in a handsome black silk holoku and appeared unusually happy and talkative. So she is in her late 70s at this point. So Flag Day, 1915. This is not Flag Day as in July, June Flag Day, but Flag Day or Balboa Day in 1915. These two images, which are in the State Archives collection on the back say September 24th, 1916. The newspaper stories about Balboa Day are dated 1915. Lee Okalani is seated here. She is receiving flags from young ladies who are delivering flags based on their nationality or country of origin. And these are flags from the nations that circle the Pacific Rim. So for 1916, the only mention of the queen in a 1916 story is that there is a film of her receiving the flags. I'd love to find out which news agency took that film and see if that film still exists. This is the queen leaving. This is John Aimoku Dominus, her Hanai son. This is John Aimoku's wife, Sybil, and his son, John Owen Dominus. So Lydia, so family. The next time Lady Okalani is at the palace is for her funeral. At the time of her death, she was conveyed at midnight to Quiet Hollow Church, where she lay in state until the evening before her by invitation only funeral service on November 18th, 1917. She is then conveyed up to Mauna Ala, where she was put in what is now the chapel. Remember the Grand Cross of the Order of the Rising Sun? I mentioned that she was given in 1882. Her royal order was carried by Lieutenant Oka on a Japanese Navy training ship that was in town that month. Members of his crew accompanied him and the queen in the procession up to Mauna Ala, and those that weren't in the procession lined up in front of the consulate to pay their respects to her as she passed. There were thousands of people paying their respects to the queen as she was conveyed up to Mauna Ala. Lady Okalani has not left, however, because she is in this portrait, which is now in the Blue Room. This portrait was painted by the artist, William Cogswell. He also painted a companion portrait of her brother, David Kalakala from photographs. Lady Okalani left the paintings in the palace when she was deposed. Her trustees gave the paintings to the territory of Hawaii. Their intention was for the painting to always remain in the palace. First Lady Pauline King, however, did not was not aware of that. She moved the painting to the dining room of Washington Place. And you can see it sitting on the floor and almost touching the ceiling. Since 2016, the Hawaii Ponui Coalition has honored the Queen on the Sunday before Labor Day with a variety of events. Likewise, we held an event in 18, 1989. I'm so used to saying 18, I got a hard time with 1900s. 1989 and 1990, we had a performance program to honor the Queen. Both years, it was, this is the Honolulu Boy Choir. Both years, it was Keiki Choirs and Keiki Hula for the Queen's love of kids. 1990, Governor Waihe attended and approached our curator, Jim Bartels, and says, hey, where does that, where does that, where, where does my painting of Livio Kamani belong? And he was in a bit of a panic because he was, where's my keys? I need to unlock the palace so I can get in to show the governor where the painting belongs. What we, the volunteers, did not know, what they knew was that a copy of the painting had been coordinated from the Hawaii Foundation on Culture and the Arts to better fit Washington Place so the original painting could return to Iolani Palace which was a super huge red letter day for those of us that are volunteers, because from 1978 until 1991, this is 
what we had to use to talk about the Queen's portrait. I would like, so I would like to invite you to come visit the palace. You can visit by going to our website, iovanipalace.org. We are open Tuesday through Saturday. There's also lots of great information on our website, and you could also choose to become a volunteer. Mahalo, and I'm going to turn it over to Andrea to coordinate answering questions. Mahalo Nui Lo Azida. I think Ralph, um, Ralph will moderate. We have received some questions in the chat. So if you'd like to stop your screen share. Okay. Thank you, Zita. That was extraordinary. Thank you, Dr. Cam. You're on mute. Zita, the, the first question actually is not about the palace. <laughs> this is a question about uh, the family of Zita Kapchoi. So oh. the question is from the Lulu Kalani Trust on Maui. They want to know, are you related to Haley Kupchoi? Her, uh, her husband's, I think his great grandmother, grandfather is my grandfather's sibling. Okay, so a, a typical I, I mean, Hawaii relationship. Yeah, yeah, we're cousins. <laughs> So the, uh, the first question about the uh, palace is related to your slide that had a canal hale and the hale for Lele Iohoku uh -huh. and, and the one of the, the third building that you had mentioned. The uh, Kinao hale, according to the newspaper, and I have not seen evidence anywhere other than that newspaper and this is it, it's Kinao Hale there was a separate structure that was used for dining and entertaining and then a structure for Prince Leleo Hoku. So Kinao Hale was supposed to be where their royal highnesses were to live and maybe hold formal receptions and then food was served in a different building which makes sense because if you want food cooked and served in one building, you'd want the fires related to cooking stoves away from where you were going to be living and sleeping because that's that's fire danger. Okay. Uh, a question about the difference between Hale Ali'i and Kinao Hale. Hale Ali'i is royal house or um, palace, which was the original palace, original home built by Governor Kekuana Olu. Kekuana Ola, Kekuana. I'm sorry. I'm getting. The, I'm pronouncing the name. Aoa. I have trouble. I have my, have my tongue has trouble with that. Kinao Hale was a home that probably was built originally by Kinao on the other side of the grounds because before the 1870s, the grounds had a lot of fences and dividing walls in it. What's mm -hmm. now the grounds? There were a lot of fences and dividing walls, and a lot of Ali'i had homes in this area. So based on the name Kinao Hale, I rather suspect it was owned by Chief Chiefus Kinao, who was um, Kuhina Nui for a while. Okay. Her eye um, infection is what gave Lydia her name Kamaka Eha. So a, a comment uh, that is beautiful to see Kahili in the room in one of your pictures. Uh, I guess uh, a subsequent question would be, are those reproductions or original Kahili? If it's black and white, it would have been original. If it's color, it is reproductions. Okay. Was it common for guests to be seated by language? You'd mentioned- This is the only chance, this is the only time I've ever seen that mentioned. Um, it would have made sense. And I suspect if we had to choose where we would sit, we'd gravitate to people we knew or people we could talk to. Um, that happens all the time when we go to parties, right? Unless there's assigned seating. And then if you've got real Akamai hosts, in, unless they're gonna force you to talk to someone because they want you to network with them for some reason, mm -hmm. would make sense. So the, uh, the gathering of the keiki, uh, in their period costumes, yeah, most delightful. Uh, do you 
know who the four-year-old butterfly was? No, I don't. We there are newspaper stories about that name all the names, and since they don't say the ages, we'd have to do a little bit of genealogy research to figure out who they were. I think maybe there is information in one of the newspaper stories about who was dressed as butterflies. Mm -hmm. I don't have it off the top of my head though. Uh, in one of these occasions, foreign dignitaries were entertained. So European music was, of course, played. Yes. But did uh, Lulu Kalani uh, continue Kalakawa's desire to promote hula? I don't recall seeing her hosting any hula performances on the grounds. Uh, do you have any information about the Red Cross flag that Liu and helpers sewed, which flew over Iolani Palace at the end of World War I? This is a Red Cross flag. There is information on the Red Cross website about that flag. It was presented to the Red Cross in September of 1917. It flew over the palace, and this is information that Ron Williams shared with us when the Red Cross was planning their centennial birthday. So it is in the Red Cross headquarters now. Yeah. Yeah. It, a copy of the flag was flown over the palace for I think maybe about 24 hours when they celebrated their 100th birthday. So check, check. they need to check on the Red Cross website for that. Right. Now, when did Lulu Kalani's body go to the palace from Kauai Hau? At midnight on November 17th, the funeral was on the 18th, the next morning. Okay. Of course, these aren't questions, but wonderful presentation. All is such a joy to listen to you tell the history. Mahalo. I have a lot of fun. <laughs> is the dress in the portrait uh, the ribbon dress from the Ali'i Reproduction Project? The Ali'i Reproduction Project dress was done because she's wearing it in the portrait and because she is also wearing it in a photograph that was taken in London where she is standing and her sister-in-law, Queen Kapi'olani, is seated. So in that wonderful photo, Kapi'olani is wearing the peacock gown, which has been recreated, and Lidia Kalani is wearing the black ribbon gown which is the one your person asking the question was asking about, yeah. And who, who was uh, responsible for that project? Teresa Valencia was spearheading it on our side. The gowns were, the recreated gowns were done by uh, Iris Vicrusis. He is a designer expert in Edwardian and Victorian fashion. He also does a lot of designs for uh, Miss Aloha Hula contestants for Mary Monarch. And Hilo. Thank you. And he has stuff on his website. He does gowns for a lot of other people and places as well. But it's been a real delight and treat to work with him. He just finished working on um, Kalakawa's coronation uniform and Kalakawa's Masonic regalia, which were unveiled last November. More reason to come visit if you haven't been here recently. Now, were the funds the Queen Kapiolani raised for education used only for men? I think they were largely used for women. Okay. At least that seems to be the sense of what I read in the newspapers. Because she was really interested in women's education. She um, knew the Mills, who opened Mills College, which is now a women's college in California and visited them when she was in uh, California in 1887 with a mind to establishing a similar college here or seminary here. How many royal orders were there, Hawaiian royal orders? The Royal Order of Kamehameha established by Kamehameha V, the Order of Kalakaua created, and then created by Kalakaua, the Order of Kalakaua, the Order of the Crown of Hawaii, the Order of Kapi'olani, and the Order of Oceania Four. Five total. There may have been a fifth. There's hints about a fifth, 
that some researchers have found, but we don't have any real concrete evidence of that created in the reign of one of the Kamehameha homes. So there, um, for people that are viewing this, there are um, in the chat, get them before we close our uh, chat window. But there's uh, an article in Hana Ho magazine about the Lee Reproduction Project a website. And also the uh, Red Cross website uh, is in the chat. Awesome. Thank you. Whoever <laughs> put that in there. OK. Uh, here's a, a nice one. This lecture series has been excellent. I'm sorry to see it coming to an end today. I think all of us that are involved with it uh, share your sentiment. But what a, what a great way to cap off the uh, series this year with, uh, with Zita uh, sharing her Manao about the, the palace. Mahalo again for inviting me. Okay, uh, so that, that completes the questions that I see. And uh, thank you uh, all for attending this year's Experts at the Cathedral series. Thank you so much. Um, Zita, I just wondered, and you might have already spoken to this, but in your specific research for this presentation, what was the most surprising thing that you found, if you if you recall? I think all the different names that Leo Kamani was known by, um, mm -hmm. which, which which brings up the challenge in looking for her. I mean, it's kind of easy after she becomes. It's not even easy after she becomes queen. Even after, after she is deposed, sometimes in newspapers, ex-queen, queen, Mrs. Dominus, or just Lady Okalani. So if you're just plugging in Lady Okalani, you're gonna miss queen or ex-queen. You're gonna miss events. You're gonna miss mentions of her, both in our papers and in papers across the country. And papers across the country don't always spell her name correctly. So it's a challenge. But I, I think what, the, I. Maybe the most amazing thing for me is that I've been taking Hawaiian language now via Zoom Saturday mornings um, for almost four years now. And what really amazed me is how much of that newspaper article I found in the Hawaiian language newspaper I was able to understand. Because three and a half years, three, four years ago, I just would not have, I wouldn't have caught any of it. I'm, I would have caught the names and that's about it. But it, it was it was it was a delight and a me and you know it just was all right <laughs> I'm getting there because that's why I'm taking the class. Wow, that's incredible! Thank you Mahalo so much for Kumu. sharing. That. I, I, he was planning on attending. Mahalo Kumu. <laughs> that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Ralph. Did you have any other questions to pose from the audience or yourself before we say Mahalo to everyone? I think uh, all the questions from the audience are always top notch. They always bring out um, details that perhaps uh, speakers didn't have a chance to share. So mahalo to the, the audience we have here. Uh, they are always uh, on the top of their game. Thank you. I so agree. I really want to mahalo everyone for joining us. Today, many of you have come to multiple episodes of the, the series, and I really want to say a big mahalo nui loa to Zita Kupchoi for sharing her incredible knowledge. You're just amazing, and we're so lucky to have you here. And to Dr. Ralph Kam, who's equally amazing for curating a wonderful series again this year. I'd also like to thank my colleague, Michelle Kisek, who has been providing technical and other support throughout the series and was with us last week. Um, she's been wonderful and it's such a great partnership. We encourage everyone who's not already connected with the Stark Hawaii Foundation to sign up for our e-newsletter so that you can stay up to date. Um, I don't have any specific programs to announce today, but we will be, we are working on programming for the coming months. And if you're signed up, you'll receive notice of upcoming programs.
programs. And as well, we see, we share it weekly, really amazing information on other organizations, other programs um, throughout the state of Hawaii, heritage related news and activities. And also want to invite everyone to consider if you've enjoyed what you've seen here and you like what you see with the Historic Hawaii Foundation website and our programming to support us um, by donating, maybe volunteering, becoming a member. You can visit, thank you, Michelle, for putting up the slide. You can visit our website and join the join us section to learn more. And thank you so much to everyone and a big ahui ho. Wishing everyone continued good health. Hopefully you're in good health. If not, hope you feel better and inspired spirits. And we look forward to connecting with you at future events. Mahalo nui loa.